And now, presenting the champion, fighting out of the red corner, this man is a podcaster. He stands six feet two inches tall, weighing in at 185 pounds. Podcasting out of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, presenting the host of T-Bone MMA Podcast, Tyler T-Bone Brack. And what's going on, guys? This is Tyler Breck from T-Bone MMA. So we're finally back at the UFC 217 live at the Madison Square Garden Arena in New York City, New York. It's the second time the UFC has ever been at the Madison Square Garden, and we got a good card headlined by champion Michael Bisbing versus challenger George St. Pierre. Then we got Cody Garbrandt versus TJ Dillashaw, Johanna Young Jacek and Rose Naman Yunus, Steven Thompson and Jorge Masvidal. From top to bottom, this card is absolutely incredible. So I will take you through every single fight on this card. This is a special pay-per-view to me, so I'm going to take you through every single fight on this card. And we're going to start at the bottom of the card. Uh, the UFC Fight Pass early prelims. These are at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time and 3.30 p.m. Pacific Time. Our first fight is in the 135-pound division. It is Ayman Sahabi versus Ricardo Ramos. Ramos. So let's start with Amayan Sahabi. She, he is from Canada. He's got a record of 7 wins and 0 losses. 43% by knockout, 43% by submission, and 14% by decision. His, opo his opponent, Ricardo Ramos, is from Brazil. He has a record of 10 wins and 1 loss. with 20% by knockout, 60% by submission, and 10% by decision. Ricardo Ramos also has a 3-inch reach advantage. So let's start with Ricardo Ramos. He's got a record of 1 win and 0 losses in the UFC. And he's won, he won his UFC debut, the unanimous decision, back in February of 2017. And he won the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu uh, National Championship in Brazil. And uh, he had 6 first-round finishes. And every single one of them by submission. 6 submission victories by 2 rear naked chokes, 3 triangle chokes, an arm bar. And he's also, on top of that, has 2 knockout victories. He was discovered on Dana White's Looking for a Fight series, and he's only 22 years old, which makes him the fourth youngest fighter in the UFC roster. His only loss is to Manny Vasquez if, via first round rear naked choke, and Manny Vasquez fought on the Dana White Contender series. I think he lost that fight, actually. And right now, he's running a two-fight winning streak since that fight. And he's fighting Aman Sahabi. He's got a record of one win and zero losses in the UFC as well. And he won his fight via unanimous decision, but was outstruck 64 to 44 but i saw that fight and it looked like to me that he won that fight but it, it caused a little bit of controversy though he's brother of of a very very good coach for us hobby one of the greatest coaches in mixed martial arts and actually head coach at george st pierre as well he's got four knockout victories and two submission victories one by rear naked choke and one by ankle lock he's been undefeated in uh He's been undefeated throughout his entire career and finished every single one of his fights except for one. And five of his seven victories are in three minutes or less. All right, this next fight was originally the headliner on the UFC Fight Pass early prelims, but got bumped down. It is Alexi, which I think this fight has gone over overlooked. This fight is absolutely, absolutely incredible. I cannot wait for this fight. Number nine ranked Alexi Olenek versus number 12 ranked Curtis Blades. This fight's actually going to be very, very fun to watch. So number nine ranked Alexi Olenek, he is from Russia. He's got a record of a whopping 52 wins and 10 losses with one draw. He's got 13% of his victories by knockout, 77% by submission, and 10% by decision. He's fighting C Curtis Blades. He's from the United States. He's got a record of seven wins and one loss with one no contest. 86% of his victories were by knockout, 0% by submission, and 14% by decision. Let's start with number 12 ranked Curtis Blades. He's got a record of two wins and one loss with one no contest in the UFC with one performance of the night bonus. He was on a three-fight winning streak, but his last victory was overturned to a no contest after he tested positive for marijuana. There's some controversy there. Is marijuana a performance-enhancing drug? Should that have been uh, switched over to a no contest? That's not a debate I'll get into right now, but it's 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 something that should be out there. His only loss in his career was to Fan Francis Ngannou, who could possibly be fighting for a title here coming up pretty soon. And that was back in February, and it was via Dr. Stoppage. He had a career he had a career in college wrestling, but actually left college wrestling to pursue a full-time career in MMA. He's fighting 
Number nine ranked Alexi Olenek. He's got a record of four wins and one loss in the UFC with two performance of the night bonuses. His last victory was over Travis Brown, which, one, which was one of his most notable victories in his career. He had the first ever Ezekiel choke in UFC history, and that was crazy because he did it from the bottom. He did it like he did it from the bottom, and the guy had him mounted. He set it up perfectly. That is why they call him the boa constrictor. And get this, he's got 40 submission victories. And now get ready for this. He's got a neck crank, three arm triangles, nine rear naked chokes, five triangles. Get this, 10 Ezekiel chokes, three arm bars, three heel hooks, one inverted arm bar, one guillotine choke, one scarf hold arm lock, whatever that is, and one bulldog choke. And he's the international master, master of sports in combat sambo. That just shows how high ranked he is in the grappling community. He's absolutely unbelievable to watch. He's got a record of 13 wins and one loss in his last 14 fights and finished his last 14 wins as well. He's been a pro since 1997 and he's kind of getting up there in age. He's 40 years old right now. So for an up and coming contender, contender that's really old for for someone who's trying to make, make, make his name in the UFC heavyweight division. All right, this next fight is the headline of the UFC Fight Pass early prelims. Like I said before, you can only find these on UFC Fight Pass. And these are, this is at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time and 3.30 p.m. Pacific Time. It is Michael, I'm going to try my best to pronounce this guy's name, Oleshnikchuk versus Ion Kudabella. Wow. Michael Oleshnik, he is from Poland. He's got a record of 12 wins and 2 losses with 67% by knockout, 8% by submission, and 25% by decision. He's, fight, he's facing... Ion uh, Kutabella, uh, he's from the Republic of Maldo Moldova, man, I'm struggling here right now. He's got a record of 13 wins and 3 losses with 1 no contest, 69% by knockout, 15% by submission, and 8% by decision. Let's start with Ion Kutabella. He's got a record of 2 wins and 2 losses in the UFC, and his last last win was versus uh, Henrique De Silva back in June. He's got 10 first round victories in his career out of his 13 fights, and get this, Nine in under one minute and 13 seconds, and seven in under 30 seconds, and two in under 10 seconds. I don't know who does that. He must just go out there and start throwing hands. But there is something to that, though. Once the fight gets gets going later on, he's got 10 first-round finishes out of his 13 victories, and both of his losses were past the first round. I believe. I might be wrong on that. And... Um, there's something to say to that. You know, if you're finishing fighters so quick, you don't really get to see what a fighter's truly made out of. I'm not questioning his heart or his determination at all, but that's just something that should be noted as well. He's got one loss in his career was by disqualification. It was to punches in the back of the head. And he's the European champion in combat sambo. So, again, he's a very good grappler as well. He's got nine knockout victories and two and uh, one submission victory. And he got an Oba Plata, which is very hard to do in mixed martial arts. We see it a lot in uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, but not so much in mixed martial arts. Really, I don't know why, because it's such, you know, when I first started Jiu-Jitsu, that's one of the first submissions I learned was the Oba Plata. So that's interesting as well. He's fighting Michael Oleśniczyk, the Polish Michael Oleśniczyk. Hopefully I'm saying his name right. He's got making his UFC debut, and right now he's riding a nine-fight winning streak. He's got eight knockout victories and one rear naked choke submission. He's got 17-1 and one amateur record, and he won two amateur titles in Poland as well. He was a TFL heavy, or a light heavyweight champion, excuse me, and trains with a bunch with a bu couple of other Polish fighters such as Marcin Tybira, John Blakowicz, and uh, Daniel Omleszczuk. So he's a he's a young he's an up and comer as well. I'm not sure how old he is, but he's He's an up-and-comer for sure, so making his UFC debut, that'll be very interesting. You can only watch those fights in the UFC Fight Pass early prelims, so go check those out. You know, this card is so stacked. Just make a night out of it. Watch the Fight Pass early prelims all the way up to the main card. Please just do that because it'll be, it'll be worth it. Trust me. All right, the next fight on the FS1 early prelims is a fight that I'm really excited for. It's, it is Randy Brown versus Mickey Gall. Randy Brown is from Jamaica. He's got a record of nine wins and two losses, 56% by knockout, 33% by submission, and 11% by decision. He's facing Mickey Gall. He's from the United States. He has a record of four wins and zero losses, 0% 0 by knockout, and 100% by submission. Let's start out with Mickey Gall. He's got a record of three wins and zero losses in the UFC with all wins by rear naked choke. He's got wins over Mike Jackson, CM Punk, and Sage Northcutt. Sage Northcutt is certainly a great opponent. Mike Jackson, I'm not too sure about him. 
CM Punk, you can have your own uh, opinions about that. He was discovered on Dana White's Looking for a Fight, and that was famous because he had his first fight ever in his pro MMA career, and he calls out CM Punk. And it took over it took well over a year for that fight to actually happen because he fought Mike Jackson. CM Punk kind of was going through some issues as well. But it finally happened, and we 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 kind of got what we expected. And Mickey Gall, he's, he's got 3-0 and in his amateur career as well, but he's got a brown belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and a blue brand in Muay Thai. But his real specialty is a brown belt in Jiu-Jitsu. Jiu he's very young. He's 25 years old, and to have a brown belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is very impressive, and you can see that. When he's on the ground, he's slick, and it's, it's really fun to watch. He's won many, many grappling uh, national championships championships so we got to look out and we should we saw in the sage north cup fight how impressive his striking is because sage north cut he's he's still young and inexperienced but he's got he's basically spent his whole life with striking and mickey gall dropped him with the right hand and followed up and choked him out so that was very impressive too so don't sleep on his uh, stand-up game but i'm hoping that he doesn't try to rely on a stand-up game because his real specialty is on the ground and he'll need that against uh, Randy Brown. He's got a record of three wins and two losses in the UFC. He lost his last fight versus Bilal Muhammad uh, via unanimous decision back at UFC 208. <clears throat> Excuse me. He's got five knockout victories and three submission victories, which was which were two guillotines and one armbar. He was discovered as well on Dana White's Looking for a Fight, and that was one of the earlier episodes. He was a ring of combat, welterweight championship, and he also has a blue, purple belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu under Henzo Gracie. So that should... Hopefully, we'll see a good uh, a good battle on the ground as well. All right, the next fight. The next fight on the FS1 early prelims is was supposed to be on the UFC Fight Pass early prelims, but that got changed, actually. It is number six ranked Ovin St. Pru versus number seven ranked Corey Anderson. I'm happy they bumped this fight up because this fight also deserves a lot of notoriety as well. This is in the 205-pound division. Let's start with number six, rank, six ranked Ovin St. Pru. He is from the United States. He's got a record 21 wins and 10 losses. 48% by knockout, 29% by submission, and 24% by decision. He's facing, excuse me, number seven ranked Corey Anderson. He is from the United States. He's got a record of 10 wins and three losses. 40% by knockout, 0% by submission, and 60% by decision. Let's start with number seven ranked Corey Anderson. He's got a record of six wins and three losses in the UFC with one performance of the night bonus. He's coming off a knockout loss to Jimmy Manoa, however, but he's got split. And also, he has a split decision loss to Shogun Hua in May of 2016. So the people that he has lost to, the opponents that he's lost to, were very high ranked opponents. And Shogun Hua, especially, don't sleep on him because he still has some some left left in the tank as well. He's two time uh, Division three All American and it was a junior college wrestler as well. He was the Tough 19 light heavyweight uh, winner, and he was a former XFL light heavyweight champion, and he had only three fights before going into the UFC, which is very quick. He's got lots of experience in the UFC. I mean, nine fights at his young age is actually very impressive. Facing high-ranked opponents like Shogun Hua and, and like Jimmy Manoa. And to add to that list, number six ranked Ovin St. Pru as well. He's got a record of nine wins and five losses in the UFC with three performances of the night bonuses and one fight of the night bonus. It should also be added that he had a record of six and one when he fought in Strike Force. Right now, he's on a two fight winning streak, and he won his last fight versus Yushin Okami, which was a mismatch. He was supposed to fight Shogun Hua, but Shogun got, Shogun got I think, was it, was it injured or sick? I can't remember. But he pulled out of that fight just a couple of days in advance. And Yushin Okami stepped out of retirement and ended up taking the fight on short notice. I was happy that Ovin St. Pru finished it the way that he did. It was actually very impressive with the Von Pru choke, we can call it now, because he's done it so many times in the octagon. He went 1-4 and four before that fight. and that, But his losses were to Glover Teixeira, John Jones, Jimmy Manoa, and Volkan Ozdemir, which are all very, very good fighters as well. So he's as well fought the highest of competition in the 205 pound division he's got 10 knockout victories and six submission victories including a calf slicer rear naked choke get this three von flu chokes and a kimura three von flu chokes and also a calf slicer no one does that in mma and uh, he's got 13 first round finishes and he's only a blue belt in brazilian jiu-jitsu which is kind of shocking because of how many submission victories that he has he's and he's been a pro since 2008 almost nine years and he's pretty young too and he didn't have a background and mixed martial arts. I believe that he was like a football player or something like that, actually. All right, this next fight was a fight that was supposed to happen at UFC 216, but 
Of course, we know what happened. Derek Lewis pulled out at the last minute, and Walt Harris ended up stepping up and fighting for Riso for Doom. That was incredible. Didn't go his way, but he's back on another pay-per-view, back-to-back pay-per-views, and he's facing the opponent that he should have fought in the first place. This is in the heavyweight division. Walt Harris versus Mark, the hand of God beer. Walt Harris, he is from the United States. He's got a record of 10 wins and 5 losses, with 100% win of his victories by knockout. He's facing Mark, the hand of God beer. He's from England. He's got a record of 12 wins and 3 losses, 75% by knockout, 17% by submission, and 17% by decision. Let's start with Mark, the Hand of Godbeer. I love his nickname, by the way. Mark, the Hand of Godbeer. Like, his last name is Godbeer. That's so much fun to say. Anyway, he's got a record of one win and one loss in the UFC, and he's also got own one in Bellator as well. But that one fight was against Chet Congo, who is also a very good opponent. His last fight was a unanimous decision victory. It was his only, his first ever unanimous decision victory at UFC 209. But he lost his UFC debut via round one submission, but came back with a unanimous decision victory. He's got nine knockout victories and two submission vi- victories. Both were by guillotine. And he's got five first-round vin- finishes to add that. He was the BA MMA heavyweight champion in Britain, and he also went 4-1 and one in his last five fights. Uh, let's start with Walt. Let his, he's fighting Walt Harris. He's got a record of three wins and four losses in the UFC. He started his cr- UFC career going 1-4, and four, but now is on a two-fight winning streak. Actually, I should change that. Uh, he's got a record of 3-5 and five in the UFC and was on a two-fight winning streak. And lost to Fabrizio Verdillo. I'm using my old notes here. He's got round two knockouts against Chase. His round, he's got a excuse me, a second round knockout against Chase Sherman back in January, which that fight was absolutely nuts. If you haven't watched that, go on UFC Fight Pass and watch that again because that fight was nuts. And he's got a round one knockout against Cyril Asker back in June. Uh, he's got all ten of his victories by knockout, and nine were in the first round, and seven were under two minutes or less. He trains out of American Top Team of Coconut Creek, Florida. And he was a Golden Gloves champion in Alabama and Florida. So he's a very good boxer as well. And he's got an amateur boxing record of 23 wins and one loss. So Walt Harris fought for Reese over Doom in his last fight. And it went how it should have gone, just to be quite honest. It, it didn't go his way. Let's just leave it at that. Uh, he, he got cut through like butter. Anyway, this fight is the headliner on the FS1 early prelims. And it... And it should be. This fight is is not getting the recognition that it deserves. Now, this is in the 155-pound division. James Vick versus Joe Duffy. This should be this should be for a ranking spot in the 155-pound rankings because these guys, especially James Vick for sure, should be in the rankings. Anyway, James Vick, he is from the United States. He's got a record of 11 wins and one loss. 9% by knockout, 36% by submission, and 36% by decision. He's facing Joe Duffy. He is from Ireland. He's got a record of 16 wins and two losses. 31% by knockout, 56% by submission, and 13% by decision. James Vick is 5 inches taller and has a 3-inch reach advantage. Let's start with Joe Duffy. He's got a record of 4 wins and 1 loss in the UFC with 1 performance of the night bonus. Right now, he's on a two-fight winning streak, and his only loss was to Dustin Poirier, who's a very good fighter as well. And get this. a lot of people, Not a lot of people know this. He defeated Conor McGregor many, many years ago by submission. He beat Conor McGregor. Let's just leave it at that. He beat Conor McGregor. He should get more notoriety than he deserves. Actually, it was kind of cool. Uh, I think, I can't remember which press conference it was, but Conor McGregor was going nuts going crazy on the stage and way up there joe duffy was on the stage as well and was just smiling at him because he knew he got him back in his back early in uh, mcgregor's career but for sure that's the most notable victory of his of his career he's got 10 submission victories he's got five rear naked chokes four arm triangle chokes or four triangle chokes excuse me and one arm triangle choke and he's got four knockout victories he also has a seven and all boxing record so he brings in like a very good complete game as well he has he, he had a three year rear oh, excuse me he's got a three he had a three year long layoff from I think 2011 to 2014 but he's gotten six and one since he's got a black belt in Japanese jiu jitsu and a blue belt in uh, Brazilian jiu jitsu so he's facing uh, James Vick he's got a record of seven wins and one loss in the UFC why isn't he ranked I don't know he's right now he's on a two fight winning streak and won his last fight by knockout against Marco Polo Reyes at UFC 211 I thought he should have gotten rankings the very next day. But he didn't. A big a win over Joe Duffy will 
should put him in the rankings for sure. His only loss was by round one knockout at UFC 199, but since then has been has looked unbelievable. He was on Team Cruz. Team Cruz that was the Ultimate Fighter live, and he lost in the semi semifinals against Michael Chiesa. He's got five knockout victories. He's got five submission victories. Excuse me, two guillotine chokes. One armbar, a rear naked choke, and a darce choke. He's got a blue belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and he's a two-time Golden Gloves champion, so he's also good on the feet. Whoops. All right, kicking off the main card is Johnny Hendricks versus Paulo Borachinaha. Whoops. Anyway, he's got a record of... Or, uh, let's, re let's restart that here. This is in the 185-pound division. It's Johnny Hendricks versus Paulo... Paulo Borachana. Borachana, I can't say his name for the life of me. Let's start with Johnny Hendricks. He's from the United States. He's got a record of he's got a record of uh, 18 wins and seven losses. 44% by knockout, 6% by submission, and 50% by decision. Let's start with Paulo. I'm not even going to attempt his last name. He's from Brazil. He's got an undefeated record of 10 wins and zero losses. 90% of his victories are by knockout. 10% by submission and 0% by by decision. He's also 3 inches taller and has a 3 inch reach advantage. So let's start with Paulo, the Brazilian. He's got a record of 2 wins and 0 losses in the UFC with 1 performance of the night bonus. Both UFC victories were by knockout as well. His last win was at UFC 212 by round 2 knockout. He's a rep, He was a member of the Ultimate, the Ultimate Fighter uh, Brazil Season 3. He was on Team Vanderlei Silva's. And he's got nine knockout victories and one submission victory, which that one submission victory is by rear naked choke. He's a, He was a face-to-face -face and jungle fight event 185-pound champion. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. He's facing uh, Johnny Hendricks. He, he's got a record of 13 wins and seven losses in the UFC with four fight of the night bonuses and three knockout of the night bonuses. Now, he's got one and four in his last five fights, two and five in his last seven, and three and six in his last nine fights. You can just pick your poison there. So basically, there he he started out strong. He was like fifteen and one, yeah, fifteen and one before fighting George St. Pierre, which many people believe that he won that fight. But since then, he's just not looked the same. And he lost his last fight against Tim Bosch. But he recently, after missing weight several times at one hundred and seventy pounds, he bumped up in weight at middleweight. And right now, he's got a record of one and one. But he missed weight in his last fight. So making weight is certainly interesting, and we'll 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 try to keep track of that if Johnny Hendricks can make 185 pounds because he wasn't able to in his last fight. In fact, he missed it by a whopping three pounds. So we need to look out for that as well. It was the former 175 pound or 170 pound champion, which that's how good he was back in the day. He beat Robbie Lawler for the title and then lost the title in the rematch. It just never really looked the same since then. He's got eight knockout victories, which include the knockout against John Fitch. And at one point he sent John Fitch flying, flying, just launched across the octagon with one punch, and we haven't really seen that since. He's a four-time Division One All-American wrestler and two-time Division One national champion. That is very impressive because the college to win the uh, Division One national championship is absolutely outstanding. So he's got a fantastic wrestling game. He's got win over Hector Lombard back in February at his in his middleweight debut. So. We'll, we'll see what happens with Johnny Hendricks. You know, I was hoping that he would kind of get his career back together at 185 pounds, 185 pounds, but he missed that weight and ended up losing against Tim Bosch. So maybe this is the fight that can, uh, maybe this is the fight that can reverse his career. I don't know because he has the potential in him, but we'll just have to see if he's able to to bring back what was once a phenomenal fighter. And, you know, the fighter that almost beat George St. Many people believe that he did beat George St. Pierre. So. If he can get back to that, um, it'll be absolutely... Because he was really fun to watch back in the day. He was just knocking people out left and right. But anyway, we got more fights to discuss. This is the 170-pound division. It's number two ranked Steven Thompson versus number four ranked Jorge Masvidal. This is our number two ranked Steven Wonderboy Thompson. He's from the United States. He's got a record of 13 wins and two losses and one draw. 54% were by knockout, 8% by submission, and 38% by decision. He's facing number four ranked Jorge Masvidal. He's from the United States. He's got a record of 32 wins and 12 losses. 38%... By knockout, 6% by submission, and 53% by decision. Let's start with number 4 ranked, Jorge Masvidal. He's got a record of 9 wins and 5 losses in the UFC with 2 performance of the night bonuses and 1 fight of the night bonus. Also, to add to that, he went 5-1 in his career at Strikeforce. His last 4 losses in his career 
were all by split decision, which means one judge out of the three had it going to him. So that that's interesting as well because that means one third of the fans, if if the judges represent the fans, which usually they don't, but theoretically one third of of the people that watched that fight believe that he won it. Uh, he's gone three to one in his last four fights, and those victories include Donald Cerrone, Jake Ellenberger, and Ross Pearson. And that victory over Donald Cerrone, where he outstruck him, was abs- was actu- actually really fun to watch. He's got thirteen knockout victories and two submission victories, and both were by or one was by Darce Choke and one was by Rear Naked Choke. He was the AFC 170-pound title holder in 2006. Now, he lost his last fight against Damian Maya. And Damian Maya, basically the entire fight, was just holding onto his back the entire time. He wasn't able to, he wasn't able to do much. It, I think that, that fight was actually three rounds. If it, if it had been five rounds, it might have been a different story, actually. And like I said before, his... Uh, his victory over Donald Cerrone was actually was absolutely incredible. The way he was able to knock him out, knocking out Donald Cerrone, is is hard to do. And uh, he recently got his nose broken, which was very rough. If you didn't watch that fight, and he's facing number two ranked Stephen Wonder Boy Thompson. He's got a record of eight wins and two losses and one draw in the UFC with three performance of the night bonuses, one fight of the night bonus, and one knockout of the night bonus. He lost his last fight, which is very close against Tyron Woodley, which that fight never really didn't really live up to expectations. And he also had a drop previously against Tyron Woodley for the 170-pound title, and that was in New York City as well. And that was fight of the night, and I think it might have been fight of the year as well. That fight was it was nuts. So for the next fight to be a dud like it was was, was really disappointing. But I'm sure we won't see that in this fight. This fight will 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 be way better than that because Jorge Masvidal will bring it. I know he does every time. He was on a two fight win streak before, uh, be- oh a seven fight winning streak actually seven fight winning streak before facing Tyron Woodley, and that includes wins over Robert Whitaker, Patrick Cote, Jake Ellenberger, Johnny Hendricks, and Rory McDonald. All those fighters are absolutely were were absolutely phenomenal. Uh, the knockout against Johnny Hendricks. Knocking out Johnny Hendricks is very hard to do. And he defeated Rory McDonald. Rory McDonald at that point was looking for a, a rematch with uh, with Robbie Lawler. He was looking for another title. He, like, he was up there. He was almost that close to winning the title as well. He's got fi- he's got a record of 57-0 and 0 in his kickboxing career uh, with 40 knockouts. So he's, he's still kind of young. I think he's 31 actually. But he's had loads of experience because he's been fighting since he was just, you know, five years old. Uh, even younger than that. Since basically he was born. He's a fifth degree black belt in Tishkin uh, Ryu Kempo Karate. And has many, many other black belts and many other uh, martial arts. And he's been basically a fighter for his entire life. Now this is interesting because Stephen Wonderboy Thompson, he's a very, very good guy. And he always he's kind of a goody two shoes, but he he is a lifelong fighter as well. He spent his whole life in the gym. He spent his whole life training for this. And Jorge Masvidal is kind of on the other end of the spectrum. He's also a fighter, but he's him being a fighter has also gotten him in trouble. You know, you hear stories about him in his younger days. I don't even think he finished high school because he just loved fighting so much, and that kind of got kind of was his demise. Stephen Thompson, he, like he was a fighter for his life. What Jorge Masvidal was. Fighted for his whole life since he was a little kid. Would always get in fights with other kids. And Stephen Thompson was also a fighter for life, but he was always fighting in the gym. So that just adds to a little bit of intrigue in this fight. I know it probably shouldn't, but that's that's interesting as well. Alright, and this next fight, it's not the co-main event, it's not the main event, but we're throwing in another title fight. Champion Johanna Young J Check versus number four ranked Rose Naman Yunez. Uh, let's start with champion Johanna Jan Jacek, one of my personal favorite fighters. She's from Poland. She's got a record of 14 wins and zero losses. 29% by knockout, 7% by submission, and 64% by decision. She's facing number four ranked Rose Naman Yunez. She's she's from the United States. She has a record of seven wins and four losses. 0% by knockout, 86% by submission, and 14% by decision. Let's start with number four ranked Rose Naman Yunez. She's got a record of four wins and two losses in the UFC with two, one performance of the night bonus and one fight of the night bonus. She won her last fight against uh, Michelle Watterson. In that fight, she landed a beautiful head kick that dropped her and she ended up getting on top of her and choking her out. And she has a split decision loss against Karolina Kovokovic, who's who is the number one contender right now. Split decision. 
and she, that fight was basically standing up the entire time, and that shows how good she is on the feet. I know she doesn't have any knockout victories, but don't sleep on her on her stand-up game as well. I'm not sure if she'll be able to compete with Johanna Janjacek on the feet, but she'll she she'll hang in there for sure. That she won't get outstruck. I I don't think she'll get outstruck like uh, Johanna Janjacek has been able to outstrike her opponents. She lost her title shot uh, versus Carlo Espa, es, Carlo. Excuse me, Carla Esparza via round three submission, and that was uh, for the Ultimate Fighter tournament tournament uh, to determine who would win the uh, championship in the 115 pound division. And that's back in 2014. She's got six submission victories, four rendezka chokes, a flying armbar, and that flying armbar was a 12 second victory, by the way, and it was and a Kimura victory. She was a black belt. She's a black belt in uh, in karate and uh, taekwondo as well. And she has a blue belt, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And her, one of her most notable victories, she just absolutely ran through Paige Van Zandt and ended up choking her out in 2015. But she absolutely smashed her. She showed how, how good of a stud she is on the ground and on the feet as well. So that was very impressive. And champion Johanna Young Jacek. I didn't even write notes on her. What is there to say? I mean, I'm just going to look at, look at her last few fights. There's, there's really not much to say. She's the women's strawweight champion. She's defended her belt five times. And she's got one performance. She's got a record of eight wins and zero losses in the UFC with two Friday Night Bonuses. And just just look at this. This is absolutely incredible. I'm going to go through every single one of her title fights and look at how much she's outstruck her opponents. She outstruck Carla Esparza 53-4. to four. She outstruck Jessica Penn. Jessica Penn. 126-25. to 25. Her last fight, or, or, uh, her fight against Valeria Letourneau, I can't say her, pronounce her name, 220 to 103. All this is on the feet, by the way. I can understand if the fighter takes the opponent to the ground and just lands a bunch of ground and pound. This is all on the feet. And uh, her, her fight against Claudia Gadelia, which that fight was probably, you know, their first fight uh, was, was, uh, was very competitive, and she barely eked out a decision victory. She outstruck her 176 to 63. Her uh, next fight was at was in the Madison Square Garden as well against uh, Carolina Kavalkovic. She outstruck struck her 171 to 50. And look at this last fight against Jessica Andrade. Jessica Andrade is a fantastic fighter, by the way, and she outstruck her 225 to 83. I'm not sure if there's ever been a more dominant champion. How she's able to technically just destroy people on the feet. She doesn't knock people out per se. Like she has several knockout victories, but she just absolutely just technically destroys all of her fighters. Since she's been champion, she has no one has even come close to beating her. So what I expect Rose Namajunas to do is just to take her down and and hope for a submission. And uh, yeah, what is what is there to say? She's one of the best, if not the best, women striker. That we've ever seen. Yeah, I, I can't imagine anyone that comes close. Maybe Cyborg, but she, Cyborg just goes out there and not takes girls' heads off. The amount of technical striking that Johanna Young Jacek has, no, I don't think any woman even comes close to her. So I absolutely love her. She's got a great personality. You know, when uh, when uh, Amanda Nunes fell out of her fight, I was praying, praying that she'd step in against uh, Valentina Shevchenko. And that's what she wanted. It was one day's notice. And she's in there. She's she's hitting mitts. She's like, please, Dana, give me the fight. That's I've never seen a woman do that. Never seen anyone do that before. Yana Young Jacek is one of, if not the my my favorite fighter. What what is there not to like about here? She she's she's tough. She goes out there and fights every time. She can smack talk. And she's she's beautiful too as well. And she's she's just everything I love about a fighter. She's everything I love about a fighter. And I hope that she can continue her dominant run as champion. But Rose Namajunas, though, don't sleep on her. She is a very good fighter. She's game as well. She When she head kicked Michelle Watterson, I got scared. I got scared for Joanna because that was very impressive. I mean, to do that against the, the Karate Hottie. Her nickname is the Karate Hottie. She head kicked the Karate Girl. She head kicked her hard. And dropped her and followed up with a rear naked choke. That takes some high level of skill to do. And she only has 10 professional fights in her career. But she, the amount of experience that she has is is really fun to watch. So that fight, with with how stacked this card is, 
it's almost overshadowed because this fight is just this card is just so stacked. But that fight, please buy the pay per view. Just buy the pay per view. You get look at this. You get Michael Bisping and George St. Pierre, Cody Garbrandt and TJ Dillashaw, Yohanna Young Jacek and Rose Amadiudas. That's worth the sixty dollars. Come on. And the co-main event is a fight that. We have been waiting for it for so long. They did a whole Ultimate Fighter series. 135 pound ch title. Co champion Cody Garbrandt versus number two ranked TJ Dillashaw. This is one of the greatest grudge matches in UFC history. I'm not joking here. These two guys absolutely hate each other. And with the background that they have coming from dip for coming from the same camp and TJ Dillashaw leaving, just add some extra drama to this fight. And if you're into that, I love I love having grudge matches as well. I'm a fight fan and that that gets me going for this fight. Champion Cody Garbrandt is from the United States. He's got an undefeated record of 11 wins and 0 losses. 82% of his victories by knockout. 0% by submission and 18% by decision. He's facing number 2 ranked TJ Dillashaw. He's from the United States. He's got a record of 15 wins and 3 losses. 40% by knockout, 20% by submission, and 40% by decision. Let's start with number 2 ranked TJ Dillashaw. He's got a record of 10 wins and 3 losses in the UFC with 3 performance of the night bonuses and 3 fight of the night bonuses. In his last fight, he absolutely destroyed John Lineker. And John Lineker was one of the one of the top up-and-comers in the 135-pound division. He had lots of uh expo he had lots of great fights before that. He had lots of momentum and TJ Dillashaw just put a stop to it almost instantly. He smashed through him. And that was just a dominant dominant victory. And John Lineker is a very good fighter as well. He won and defended. He won and defended his 135-pound championship two times, but lost it to Dominic Cruz in a very close fight. That some people had it in TJ Dillashaw's favor. He believes that he won that fight as well. I personally think that Dominic Cruz edged him out in that fight, but he certainly did have a good performance against Dominic Cruz as, uh, as well. Now he won the title against uh, Hedden Burrell, and Hedden Burrell was on I think a 30 something crazy, like a 32-fight winning streak. And his shin ran into Hannah Burrell's skull, and that all ended. That was one of the biggest upsets in UFC history. No one was expecting TJ Dillashaw to win that fight because of how dominant Hannah Burrell was going into that fight. And get this, he beat him again, and almost impressive, almost more impressively than he did the first time, which is just hard to top. And with performances like that, if you can keep that up, Cody Garbrandt could have his hands full in this fight. Now, he went to the finals on the Ultimate Fighter Season 14, but lost in the finals against John Dotson. That was a three-time NCAA Division I qualifier, or a three-time NCAA qualifier for wrestling, and he trains with Dwayne Ludwig. He trains with Dwayne Ludwig. Now, he was recruited by Uriah Faber at Team Alpha Male, and that just adds to the drama. I'll get to that later, though. Champion Cody Garbrandt. He's got a record of six wins and zero losses in the UFC with one perform performance of the night bonus and one fight of the night bonus. Now, he dominated, absolutely dominated Dominic Cruz in, his, in their title fight. I'm, I, I can't remember the last time a challenger has had that much success against a champion. You could say Conor McGregor and Jose Aldo, but that fight was 13 seconds. He dominated Dominic Cruz, and Dominic Cruz usually just goes out there and just just technically kind of what uh TJ Dill, or kind of what um Johanna Young Jacek does to her opponents just goes out there and stylistically just breaks them down which is very fun to watch from uh, Dominic Cruz but Cody Garbrandt just went in there and slaughtered him there's never I can't remember a fighter that's ever that's even come close to doing that to Dominic Cruz nobody I mean uh Uriah Faber caught him in a guillotine choke early in Dominic Cruz's career Cody Garbrandt just ran through him, ran through him. The great, the single greatest uh, uh, title contender uh, performance that I've, I think I've ever seen in my my whole life of watching the UFC. He's got nine uh, knockout victories and seven of which were in the first round. Now he he going into uh, the fight against Thomas Almeida, he was just another one of those young up and coming prospects. Didn't get that much attention, but after beating the undefeated Thomas Almeida, Thomas Almeida was twenty one and zero at the time. And knocking him out in the first round, that kind of sent sent him sent his career sent his career going because the next fight was against Takeya Mizugaki and he knocked him out quicker than Dominic Cruz did. I think it was in under a minute. And Takeya Mizugaki was one of the greatest fighters ever in the 135 pound division. And he just ran through him. Now get this: he's got a record of 32 wins and one loss as an amateur boxer, and he also has a background. He was a senior national All American in high school, and that was for wrestling. So he's got this perfect. He's got a great game. He's 
his boxing is absolutely incredible, and his wrestling is up to par as well. Now, he trains out of Team Alpha Male, and you know, for those of you that you know, I think everyone watching this knows what go, what's going on with Cody Garbrandt and T.J. Dillashaw. T.J. Dillashaw left Team Alpha Male, and Cody Garbrandt is a member of Team Alpha Male, and uh, T.J. Dillashaw went to go train with uh, Dwayne Ludwig. I won't get into the specific details of it, but. Lots of drama, lots of back and forth between them, especially that boiled over at the Ultimate Fighter, which was a very, very, very entertaining season as well. I did a whole series on it, actually, which I won't get into that right now, but a whole series on it, and what an entertaining season it had. TJ Dillashaw edged out Cody Garbrandt, uh, coaching-wise anyway, but that really won't matter here in, in this fight coming up. So that fight... And I'll get the nerves going. I mean, I love good grudge matches, and I don't like to pick sides. It's just going to be a fun fight to watch. Speaking of fun fights to watch, that's exactly what we have here in the 185-pound no, pound division. For the very top, the pinnacle of the 185-pound division. I would have never thought I'd say this two years ago. Champion Michael Bisming versus George Rush St. Pierre for the 185-pound title. Whoever saw that coming? Back back in June June third of uh, 2016, before Michael Bisming fought Luke Rockhold, what if I told you this fight was going to happen in the next few years? You would have laughed right in my face. But here we are, champion Michael Bisming versus George Rush St Pierre. Champion Michael Bisming, he is from England. He's got a record of 31 wins and seven losses, 58 percent by knockout, 10 percent by submission, and 29 percent by submission. He's facing the former 175 170 pound champion. George Rush St. Pierre. He is from Canada. He's got a record of 25 wins and 2 losses. 32% by knockout, 20% by submission, and 48% by decision. Let's start with George Rush St. Pierre. He has got the second most victories in the UFC. With 19 victories and only 2 losses in the UFC. With 4 fight of the night bonuses, 1 knockout of the night bonus, and 1 submission of the night bonus. He's a former welterweight champion and defended that belt a whopping 9 times. And has the second longest uh, reigning title title reign uh, based on days anyway. He held the title for 2,204 days and never really lost it. I know that fight against uh, John, Johnny Hendricks was very controversial. But he retired as champion. So he's coming back to go for a second belt. Now he's a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and he's got multiple multiple black belts and different types of karate as well. And just let's just look back at the people he's fought in his career. A lot of these people it, it's kind of interesting because these are some of the best that the Walter division has ever had, but you barely ever hear from them anymore. You know, Matt Hughes with all due res- I mean, he recently got into a car accident. I won't get into that right now, but uh, God bless Matt Hughes, Matt Sarah, John Fitch, BJ Penn, Tiago Alves, Dan Hardy, Josh Koscheck, Jake Seals, uh, Carlos Condit, Nick Diaz, and Johnny Hendricks. Some of the best, some of the best fighters that we've ever seen. Look at this: Sean Shirk, Frank Trigg, Jason Miller. Some of these guys, you, Carl Parisian, uh, Thomas Denny. You, you don't hear from these guys anymore. You just don't hear from them anymore. So. But nevertheless, these guys are some of the best fighters to ever fight in the 170-pound division. And he just d- just destroyed destroyed all of them. So to see him back, what, he hasn't fought since 2013. It's going to be four years, almost on the dot, actually. He fought, I think, November of uh, 2013. Almost on the dot. Four years on the dot, almost, since he fought. And that last fight against Johnny Hendricks was really the worst that we've ever seen him, to be honest. Um and he hasn't finished a fight. This should also be noticed. He hasn't finished a fight since 2009. And that was a corner stoppage against BJ Penn. And the last time he really finished someone in the octagon was 2008 against Matt Serra. Not that that really matters because he just... If there's a fighter that you should be, if you're an up-and-coming fighter, be George St. Pierre. Because, you know, he just works on every single level of his game. His, look at his wrestling. He looks... He's able to take down, like... College wrestlers, national championship wrestlers. He's able just to just wipe them out. You know, if you look at him, he looks like a former NCAA wrestler. He's not. And look at his strength. He's absolutely, he's absolutely, when you look at him doing uh, gymnastics, how much strength he has is really fun to watch as well. And his striking is is absolutely unbelievable as well. And his Brazilian jiu-jitsu as well is up to par uh I was up to par, and I'd say 
of course, my, George St. Pierre has Michael Bisming uh, in the in the rest in the grappling anyway. But Michael Bisming, will he has will he have an advantage up on the feet? We'll have to see. We'll have to see because George St. Pierre has a background in karate as well. So it'll be interesting to see. This fight is nothing but interesting. That's all I can say. I can't give you predictions because I don't know what George St. Pierre has to offer. So let's just go with uh, champion Michael Bisping. He's got the most victories in UFC history. 20 victories and 7 losses in the UFC with 2 performance of the night bonuses and 5 fight of the night bonuses. So really for this fight, to add to all the drama to this fight, they're fighting for the most victories in UFC history. He's on a 5 fight winning streak right now. It is the longest of his career. And these wins include Anderson Silva, Luke Rockhold, and Dan Henderson. Three of some of the best well, best middleweights in the in the history of the middleweight division. Finished all of his fights. Look at this. He's finished every single one of his fights until he fought Matt Hamill. So people say that he doesn't have knockout power. People love to say that. And he proved all of them. I said that too. I said that too. I'm guilty of it. But he knocked out Luke Rockhold standing up. So don't sleep on his finishing ability and his knockout power. And he works with Jason Perillo. So his... His striking has been on par lately. He's finished, or uh, he's got 18 knockout victories and three submission victories. Two are by armbar and one by guillotine. And I just found this out the other day. He, the reason why they call him the Count is because he's actually a Polish Count. You know, I'm, I'm going to go into this a little bit. I probably shouldn't, but I'm going to anyway. His family, uh, his lineage is from Poland, and uh, back, his ancestors many generations ago did a deed for a king, and the king granted him. Uh, granted his family some land and during uh, World War II uh, the Nazis came in and killed much of his family except for his grandfather his grandfather escaped went to Britain had his father that had Michael Bisping and based on the lineage he's actually a count so one of his managers gave him the nickname uh, Michael the Count Bisming just because he's a count and that's that's a very unique nickname which is actually very, really really cool and to add to his entire resume standing up He's got a brown belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, so don't sleep on his ground game as well, but he never goes to the ground. He's got 16-6 and six as a middleweight, and he won the Ultimate Fighter Season 3 way back in the day. Oh, so there we go. Every single fight at UFC 217. This is one of the best cards that we've had of the entire year, on par with UFC 214. No, 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 no. This is way better than UFC 214 because we got champion Michael Bisping versus George St. Pierre. Who saw that coming? And... Cody Garbrandt and TJ Dillashaw, Yanni Young Jacek and Rose Naman Yunus, um, Stephen Thompson versus Jorge Masvidal, and some of these some of these other fight, fights are going overlooked as well. James Vick and Joe Duffy, that's going to be a very good fight as well. Walt Harris and Mark DeHanna Godbeard, that's that's going to be a slugfest. Fight of the night contender right there. Ovin St. Preux and Corey Anderson, Mickey Gall and Randy Brown. Mickey Gall is one of my favorite fighters because I just love his personality. And uh, Alexi Olenek and Curtis Blades, way down in the UFC fight past early prelims. From top to bottom, this card is, is absolutely stacked, which is the best way to describe it. Absolutely stacked. And uh, live at the Madison Square Garden Arena, the second ever event that we've had there, which just adds to the drama that – adds to the intrigue in this fight. I shouldn't say drama. So – I, there's not much I can say. I mean, this this event has gone overlooked. Not a lot of people are talking about it. People love to talk about, you know, um, Conor McGregor. People love to talk about all these other stars, Floyd Mayweather. This this is the fight that you don't want to miss. This uh, this is the these are the fight cards you don't want to miss. You're missing out if you don't buy this fight card. By the way, I'm just gonna say that right now. You are missing out. You can't call yourself a UFC fan if you are not looking forward to this card. So, anyway, signing out. Uh, this is Tyler Burke from T1 MMA. And I will catch you guys later. Happy Halloween, by the way.